Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in Internet Shitlords. And uh, today I'm here to talk to you about how it's been a popcorn eating week for me. Like, you know that, yeah, meme, the gif meme of the guy just smiling eating popcorn while he's watching some horrific disaster in, hor in bold that affects people he despises? <laughs> well, that's kind of been me this week, right? Um, what we've had happen first was with the, you know, these are all conflicts of SJWs cancelling each other, right? And the first one that came up was the Luke Crane Perfect RPG Scandal featuring Adam Robot Orgasm Kobold. Now, if you want to know the story about uh, the Adam Kobold Robo Orgasm Rape Incident or something like that, um, you should uh, check out... Uh, I, I did a video about Kobold, so look it up below. I think it's called SJW Designer... Um, gets himself cancelled or something like that. Um, or if you want to know about the Luke Crane issue and this, you know, how he tried to start a Kickstarter with a bunch of SJW luminaries and then tried to sneak in his friend Adam Coble into it and that it's caused a massive uproar. The whole project was cancelled and now they're talking about cancelling him too. Um, so all that we talked about in the last episode of Inappropriate Characters, which is, um, it's available now, so go check it out on the Inappropriate Characters channel. It was a really good episode. We had a lot of interesting conversations about that and about um, Ravenloft, which is also a topic I'm going to get into right now, but not the specifics of Ravenloft itself. So if you want to hear my opinions on the, the upcoming Ravenloft 5e product, check out Inappropriate Characters. All right. So that was scandal number one. Scandal number two is uh, Swordsfall, who, uh, if you're not familiar with Swordsfall, he is a guy that came on the scene a couple of years ago, I think now. Yeah, it would have been a couple of years at this point. And he um, is a, allegedly a black game designer who was going to make an Afro-futurist RPG called Swordsfall. And uh, he did a big Kickstarter raise, $200,000 largely from uh, white liberals, and uh, then never produced anything from that. But he did a bunch of, you know, accessories that he sold for extra profit, probably funded with the money he got for his Kickstarters, who knows. Um, and he spent most of his time viciously attacking anyone who disagreed with him in the slightest way. So if you, if you disagreed with Swordsfall anywhere... Um, if you had, if you were on the wrong ideological side from Swordsfall, he was the guy who would stand up there and he'd call you a white supremacist, right? Um, he would do this as the banner that other uh, white SJW gamers would hold up. You know, people, some very, some very well-known supposed champions of, of social justice, uh, white-skinned champions of social justice in uh, the gaming field, you know, had uh, had gotten really, really buddy buddy with uh, with Swordsfall, and were waving him around as their, you know, as their uh, not their shield exactly, but rather as their attack dog, basically. You know, like they were using him to to be able to have because it's one thing if like some some pasty white guy from California accuses you of of being a racist but if uh you know if a black game designer accuses you of being racist it makes more much more of an impact in fact you could pretty much sum up most of what sword of what swordfall did as being a kind of postmodern liberal minstrel show and and i'll explain what i mean right uh, um you know a minstrel show was a type of if you can call it entertainment that occurred in the 19th and 20th century, where you had black performers and sometimes white performers painting themselves black, right, uh, putting on blackface, who would uh, engage in a series of activities, song and dance and jokes and whatever, that um, were essentially portraying the the grossly stereotyped perspectives that were held of their people by um, white people, mainly Democrats, you know, in the 19th century and early 20th century, mainly in the South, right? So it, it was a bunch of, 
of people, some of them black people, some of them white people putting on blackface, that were taking on um, the stereotypical expectations of what white Democrats, you know, of the middle classes and up, which would go to see these, these shows, ex wanted to see them as, wanted to portray them as, you know. And, of course, that has long since fallen out of fashion, but essentially what you see today on social media is a kind of new, nouveau postmodern version of that, where you have um, black pop culture people, um, people of color that, that, are, that are involved in game design or in anime or you know, video games or comics or whatever, um, that are intentionally putting on a performance um, and are sometimes being used to or, or, or demanded to put on a performance um, of what modern day white SJW liberals who vote Democrat expect them to behave like, would want them to be. It is the perspective of what they imagine to be the right type of black person that satisfies their interests. <laughs> and this is, this is largely, uh, you know, so like the idea of a, a black game designer who's doing an Afrofuturist RPG and who gets to go out there and champion social justice and, and BLM and all that and call all the people that the white SJW liberals vote Democrat, um, already didn't like racist, call all their enemies racist for them, a black skin person that'll go there and call them racist. That, that was a, you know, that was what in many ways he was really selling. Well, that and an RPG that turned out not to be an RPG at all, just a kind of an art book that he never actually finished producing. Those were the two things Swords Ball was selling. But now he's gotten himself into some tremendously serious trouble, apparently, on account of uh, kind of a uh, harassment situation, online harassment, and I don't know, I think in-person harassment too. Um, some people have come out and spoken out against him um, about, you know, bad personal behavior that was secretly going on. Um, the first person that came out against him is apparently a, um, a woman of color, and she actually had the very quite a correct phrase uh, in her in her um, public letter shaming him that you know he was actually um, in his in his ability in his uh, tendency to claim that everything that was actually about him was about his race he was ending up um, becoming the model of why people hate minority you know, pop culture figures, right? Uh, uh, which is, which is quite funny because, of course, the, the model that the SJWs love, SJWs are the 8% of the population that everyone else despises, is going to be a model everyone else is going to despise. Um, but anyway, so he's got into huge trouble now. And they're talking about canceling him. He's probably done for. Um, Luke Crane is probably done for. But I have a question, and this is the, the real center of the topic for tonight, which is, how come Jessica Price isn't done for? I mean, bear with me for a second. Jessica Price, in case you haven't heard, again, watch Inappropriate Characters, if you like, to, before this, to, to get the whole story of the new Ravenloft book. But she is the major person involved in the production of the new Ravenloft book for Wizards of the Coast, which is, seems really odd, right? Because Jessica Price has basically done harm to every company she's ever worked for and has a tendency to brutally attack the fan base of every game product she's ever worked for. And so, of course, if you're Wizards of the Coast, you're going to go, oh, yeah, that's who we want to hire now, right? Like, it is incredible how these people, you know, even, only, I think only feminists, maybe feminists and, like, um, trans people can fail upwards so consistently, right? Because, you know, uh, Luke Crane, Kobol, Swords Fall, you know, Swords Fall is a person of color. He's still not going to get away with it, it looks like. Um, but, I mean, you've got... <laughs> when, when it comes to women, um, and specifically feminists, uh, you, then, then someone like Jessica Price... She can, 
um, she could just get away with whatever she wants to, right? Uh, and and she'll somehow be pushed upwards in spite of, of failing, right? Um, it's it's remarkable, and uh, that it's not just her. It's it's uh, happened to a lot of uh, of different people who have. You know, who are these feminist icons that they come in, they're hired for some big project, the project is a disaster, it hurts the company, and they're hired for a bigger project, right? And now Jessica Price is here being brought in to uh, work for Wizards of the Coast on their big new setting book, Ravenloft. And, like, that's, that's one question, right? One question is, why would Wizards hire this monster, right? Why would they hire someone that is, that is so toxic to every company she's ever touched, right? But the bigger question in another way is like, why aren't the SJWs canceling her, right? Like this is Wizards of the Coast, which for years now the SJWs have insisted is the den of evil, right? It's the, 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 great, um, the great Satan, you could say, right? The company that, is, that, they, that, has, uh, that is so terribly problematic, um, it mainly because they haven't listened to the SJWs and fired Mike Merles. And Mike Merles, of course, his main crime was hiring me and Zach Smith on 5th edition, meaning that 5th edition was, will always, the success of 5th edition will always be tied to our names and not to the names of, you know, he didn't hire SJW designers. He hired SJW designers on 4th edition and it was a complete disaster, right? Well, he didn't, uh, Wizards did. He wasn't in charge at that time. Um, but Merle's got me, and 5th edition is the best, you know, the most successful, I'm not going to say the best in terms of quality, but the most successful RPG edition that Wizards of has ever done. Um, and and they, they hate that, and they hate Merle's for it, and they hate, they hate that when they demanded after the Player's Handbook came out that me and, uh, and Zach should somehow be publicly denounced by Wizards of the Coast, that didn't happen, and Merle said basically there was... You know, none of the charges had any evidence against him, which none of them did at the time. It turns out that then later there were some claims against Zach Smith. Um, there have never been any, not, none of the, the claims that these people made up about me. You know, like, yeah, that, that, <laughs> that sorry sack of garbage, right? That, that walking pile of diabetes, Bruce Baugh, who openly said, he just invented, RPG pundit, opposed the inclusive language in the 5e player's handbook. He just invented that out of nowhere, right? Uh, with the addition kind of being, oh, because he's, you know, transphobic, right? None of that was true. He knew it wasn't true. And when I told, when I said outright that that wasn't true, I stated so publicly, um, he just kept right on going. And a bunch of the other SJWs just kept right on going because in fact, they, re they realized that that had kind of bothered me because it was such an open, blatant falsehood that they just completely pulled out of their ass. So they just kept repeating it, knowing it was a complete lie, right? And so these are the kind of scumbags that you're, you're dealing with here. But anyways, I digress. The point is that Wizards never did fire Mike Merles, right? Because when, when Merles didn't condemn us, then they demanded to Wizards that Mike Merles be fired. And they did that for years and years and years and years. And for one moment, they kind of thought he was fired. Then it turns out that no, he just, you know, it, it wasn't the head of D&D &D anymore. He was doing other work for Wizards, but he's still there, right? And all the SJWs know this. And in fact, Jessica, Jessica Price, the moment she got onto, uh, the, well, the moment it became public on Twitter that she was involved in the new Ravenloft book, the very first thing she does as a recognized employee of Wizards of the Coast, was shit on Wizards of the Coast. The very first tweet that she posts is like, oh, I know that some of you would never, you know, are boycotting Wizards because of Mike Merles, and that's completely right of you because Wizards is horrible for having, you know, for still having Mike Merles employed. You have every right to do that, right? So she's going and attacking her own company as like day one, right? Like, which is kind of an escalation for Price, from what I understand, because usually she, you know, the first time it took her ages, and then the second time it took her at least a few months. This time, she's going off right from the start. And why not? Because they keep firing her for other projects, right? So if you've got a record of shitting on your own company, 
And then the next person hires you after you've shat on your own company. You must think, well, this person wants to hire me to shit on my own company. And apparently Wizards does because they haven't done anything to her. They haven't, they haven't fired her for it or denounced her for it, right? She's publicly stated that Wizards is an awful company for, for having Mike Merles employed, right? And that it's completely right for people to boycott it. But then she goes on to say, but, you know, Merles had nothing to do with this thing that I'm doing, right? Um, and, you know, you can't really have both of those positions at once, Jessica. You know, it's, there is a, a ridiculous level of hypocrisy and covering your ass, right? It's hilarious that you can be condemning. It's like, you know, if you were a member of, I don't know, the, the anti-Chinese league, while at the same time talking about how awful the anti-Chinese league is, right? Like, you can't do that. Right? You can't say, oh yeah, I'm a member, but it's terrible and you're right to, to, to protest against it, right? Like that, that doesn't quite work, right? It's, um, you, you are, uh, you, if you really believe that Wizards is a reprehensible company, why would you ever get a job for them, right? Why would you accept it? Because, I mean, I know like, for example, um, I would I would never work for Politico or The Atlantic, right? I mean, I know for a fact that they're terrible companies and they could offer me a, a, a shitload of money, but I know that the price of that would be too high. I mean, well, but you know, if they gave me, no, even if they gave me complete internal control, I know that they'd be doing, that they would be doing wrong, right? In general, unless the complete shift, unless they completely reformed and shifted to actual you know, reporting or something like that. Um, but as they are, never, right? And and yet Jessica Price took a job for D&D as it is. You know, I wouldn't work for the Russian government <laughs> I because I think the Russian government is pretty awful. Likewise, you know, the, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, you know, I would not work for these companies, especially because knowing, you know, Jessica Price, she's a feminist, right? She's supposedly a leftist. She supposedly has principles that one would think she would value above money. You know, I wouldn't work with Varg Vikerns, you know, because, you know, he's actually a real racist. You know? <laughs> and, and so, <clears throat> so I wouldn't, you know, it didn't matter how much money there was in on it for me. I wouldn't accept it, you know, and I wouldn't likewise not work with Bruce Baugh <laughs> for the same reason, you know, um, there, there's, you know, or, or I guess swords fall. <laughs> so there's, there's all, um, there are principles that stop a normal person um, from going too far. Now, maybe, I don't know, she's got a dying mother she needs to support, right? But even, even there, like, what kind of respect could your mother have for you after you've done something that goes completely against everything you believe in, you know? Like, all, all of your principles. Because especially knowing that from the, you know, from the SJW point of view, the reason that they've hired um, Jessica Price and the reason that they've hired all of these, all the people that are on Raven, like, uh, check out the Inappropriate Characters episode. I pointed out the list of all the famous RPG luminaries who are working on Ravenloft. And instead of, you know, by name, I, I identified them by pronoun. And they were like, you know, she, her, they, them, she, her, they, them. No pronoun vegan. Yeah, apparently vegans have no pronouns. You know? um, another vegan with no pronoun. Another she, her. A they, them. Uh, a she, they, or something like that, which is quite, you know, that, that was a super special one. And a single he, him, but it's okay because he, he's not white, right? Um, and of these people, by far the one that has the most, like if you look at, on, in terms of jobs they have done, the most connection to role-playing, it is Jessica Price. Uh, the other ones have largely produced only kind of like uh, itch.io games, you know, like SJW story games that nobody cares about or have like, you know, they're, they're on blogs or something like that. There's a couple of them have no, apparently no visible experience in, in RPGs whatsoever. Um, and it's very clear, clear that these are a collection of diversity hires that have been taken on specifically you know, and regardless of their talent, because some of them might have talent, I don't know, most of them are basically unknowns, you could kind of assume by the politics of a lot of them that they won't have talent because it's a very safe bet 
based on mountains of experience that anyone that is loudly vocal in SJW politics is also talentless. Um, but, you know, they might, but that's not the reason they were hired. They were hired because of their pronouns or because of the color of their skin or because of their, their uh, rainbow flag or whatever other reason. So that Wizards, which is owned by a multinational corporation, right, <laughs> Hasbro, can kind of get ideological cover from the SJW left, right? To say, look, look, no, we've hired Jessica Price. See, we're the good guys. You know, it doesn't matter what else we're doing, right? And I mean, what else would be maybe, you know, I don't know, are they, <laughs> I'm not saying they are, but are they doing child labor or, you know, at least bad conditions in the factories that produce their dolls or stuff like that? Those would be the important things to me. But the important things to an SJW is that Mike Merles has not yet been fired and they're using Jessica Price's ideological cover. So why aren't SJWs trying to cancel her? Like really, how does she justify working for a company that she herself believes is doing evil, right? And that is representative of an evil um, because you can't claim I'm reforming it from within because that's not, that's not happening clearly. You're being used as a token. The company is not changing its, its actual wider practices in any spe special way, right? Uh, yes, they've hired a number of people to give them a certain cover, right? Probably paying them miserable amounts, you know, minuscule wages. <laughs> because these days, you know, nobody... Sh being a freelancer, working on a per-word basis is is the most... The dumbest thing you could do in the role-playing hobby today. It, it pays, like, practically nothing. I don't know. I think it's four or five cents a word, right? It's... it's uh, when you could, you know, if you have, if you have no talent, I guess you can do that, you know, and, and then your, your work will be kind of edited by committee and by a kind of a technical writer until it's something semi-presentable. Um, and then you get to have your name there and you get to like, that's the only reason most people today actually do this, actually get, um, work in, in the RPG big business industry is so that they can claim, look at me, you know, I'm an industry professional, right? But you make way more money if you have talent being, you know, an, an indie game producer <laughs> that's actually good. The problem is their games, you know, their HIO games on you know, story games are garbage that no one would, you know, no one would play. So <laughs> they're not making any money at all that way. So I guess that in context, four cents a word might seem all right. Um, but, you know, that that's, that's not changing, you know, like... You got this from, from a normal person's perspective. You could say, well, you know, it's a compromise, right? They don't do everything I like. But, but SJWs aren't about compromise. It's all or nothing. Mike Merles continues to exist. He hasn't yet been destroyed. So how come you're working for them? You Wouldn't one of the conditions of employment be his firing? How can you exist? How can you be in the same space and work with the same company that continues to hire Mike Merles? And make money from that. You're not, as far as I know, Price isn't donating her wages. She's keeping that money for herself. And if she now says she will, I would, you know, she'd better post a receipt for that. So, you know, it, it, it smacks of this incredible level of hypocrisy that somehow nobody has commented on. So since the SJWs are in a killing mood this week, right, since they're, since they're cannibalizing their own, you know, why not make it three out of three, guys? Give it a thought. You know, Jessica Price is a big fish. The person that writes the first big takedown article about how horrible she is and, and gets all the other people to turn on her, you know, and, you know, you can, you can call her a Karen or something like that. You know, white women these days, it's, it's, it's not that hard. You'll find something to make it really stick. And, and fundamentally, she's, she's working for the bad guys and she's making money off them while granting them legitimacy, right? That's the argument right there. I've done your work for you, SJWs. Now go forth and, you know, do what you're going to do to your own kind. <laughs> I guess that's everything for today. If you like this video, please share it. Please like it. Um, please post it with it anywhere that, you know, some uh, you, uh, there are other people you think will be interested in it or where you think, um, you know, people get pissed off by it too. Yeah, because <laughs> that's, uh, that's always part of the, the, the process of discourse in our modern world. Um, and if you want to support me, I mean, I've got a Patreon page, a PayPal page. I'm always very grateful to anyone who, who tosses money at me directly for that, you know. 
Um, but if you want to support me and get something back for yourself, please consider checking out my RPGs like you know, Star Adventure, Lion and Dragon, The Old School Companion, which is a source book, um, well, medieval authentic stuff that you can add to your D&D campaign. Um, and if, if you're looking for something a little less... I mean, none of these are very pricey. I think Lion and Dragon, like, the, the soft cover is 22 bucks. But, but if you're looking for something less expensive than that, check out the RPG Pundit Presents PDF series, right? There's 104 issues now. The newest one has just come out. Uh, RPG Pundit Presents number 104, which is more medieval authentic secret societies. There's another half dozen secret societies that are medieval authentic. Some of them are real secret societies that actually existed in the Middle Ages, like the Gugliamites or the troubadours, um, and then others are groups that are a little bit anachronistic or that are groups that could credibly have existed in the Middle Ages, whether or not we have proof that they did. So and then each one of them is detailed with like their background, their history, their rituals, their benefits to members. Um, it's, it's not um, heavy on mechanics, but it's basically fully OSR compatible. Um, it's heavy on, on details of you know, setting material. So you've got these groups that can be sometimes allies or enemies. Some of them are neutral. Um, some of them are perhaps a bit more sinister and others, uh, it'll depend on what side you're on. Uh, so check that out. If you don't like that idea, there's 103 other uh, issues for you to take a look at. And when you buy one of those, it costs between 99 cents and two ninety uh, five uh, $4.99. Maybe it's the most expensive one. I think this one's two ninety nine, if I remember correctly. I, I don't know off the top of my head. The hundred and four, uh, it just came out, so I haven't paid too much attention to the ticket price. But it's basically like you're buying me a coffee, right? And in exchange, you're getting something back, though. So it's a nice way if you want to encourage me to keep working, keep writing RPGs, keep producing stuff, and keep doing videos. Um, Check that out. Oh, and one one more thing. I've just watched um, Aaron the Pedantic's live stream where he talks in far more detail than I did about the Swordsfall thing. So if you want more information, check that out. It's him and his wife doing a podcast. It's, I, I'm pretty sure it's the Aaron the Pedantic channel. I'm, <laughs> I hope I'm not getting that wrong. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's... Uh, his his uh, live stream was really really good, and you know I I I've been on it I've been subscribed to his channel for quite some time. He did a review I think of uh, a couple of my books, um, but he was just okay. He was kind of blasé. But when it's him and his his I'm pretty sure it's his wife that are doing the podcast together, that's that's some real dynamic. She's much better at it than him. So so yeah, uh, check them out. Uh, just a little shout out to them because. Uh, I think that if you want more info, I'm not going to talk more about Swordsfall, I think, so if you want more info about that, check, check out that video and check out Aaron's channel. And I guess that's it for today. Currently smoking, um, what is this, a Lorenzetti Solitario Horn plus uh, Argento Natural.